and we saw even with Sennacherib. Uh, Sennacherib had a, a glaring defeat as God himself defeated Sennacherib's army, went home, and his own sons killed him. I mean, so um, the fact that you were the king doesn't mean you were going to be the king tomorrow, and it doesn't mean that your kids were going to be king. Well, Nebuchadnezzar was indeed the son of a king, and it was Nebuchadnezzar's father, um, Nebuchadnezzar, who was used of God to, uh, I mean, as they put the nail in the coffin of the Assyrian Empire. He was the one that defeated the Assyrians. And so, basically, Nebuchadnezzar stepped into the void as his dad uh, died and instantly became, if you want to say, the biggest bully on the block. Uh, his enemies were pretty much whoever he felt like fighting against, and nobody wanted to pick a fight with him. And so that's who God is going to use to defeat Judah. Uh, when his army starts to march, Judah knew where they were coming. It wasn't going to the north. There was no, st there was no, no nation up there. It was just a group of, of nomadic peoples now. Um, if you remember, we talked uh, with Assyria. When they conquered Israel, they removed most of the people from the land. Basically, removing any threat of insurrection, of any threat of rebellion. And so Judah is uh, next in the prophetic timeline. And it's interesting because historically, as we look at it, we have it in Scripture, um, there's three waves of, I'm going to say, uh, Babylonian attacks. Uh, Babylon comes and attacks and conquers and takes away some of the people. And uh, Judah, and we'll see this as we go here today, um, Judah rebels, uh, kind of what rebellion they could offer, and Babylon comes back and says, slap, 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 guess what? We're going to take some more of your people. A little bit more time elapses, and Judah comes back, or Babylon comes back and says, I'm not playing this game anymore, and annihilates the city. And so um, the defeat of Jerusalem proper takes place over, over a, a few years, but when it's done, it's done in, in a very final way. Uh, let's see here, a little bit more background as we get started here. Oh, I mentioned uh, Nebuchadnezzar defeated the Assyrians. His father defeated the Assyrians. Nebuchadnezzar stepped up. He defeated the Egyptians. So if we look at a map, I've got one tucked in, but it's, it's way toward the end of the lesson. Uh, if you look at a map, uh, by taking the Assyrians to his, let me take a look at a map here, his northwest, and the Egyptians way down to the, to the southwest of, of that region of what we'd call the Middle East, um, he pretty much, like I said, he had no enemies then, at least none that wanted to rise in rebellion. The two biggest uh, enemies at that point were defeated. Now, we know that his kingdom will be defeated by the Medes and the Persians, but that's, that's a little bit down the road yet. That's not going to happen right now. And so let's look at the, let me get turned here, to the slides that we have. Uh, quest, uh, let's see here. Should be good. See if everything cooperates. Sometimes it does, and it's not going to cooperate today. Beautiful. Well, I know what the slides say. <laughs> uh, our question that we have as we get started here is, how did the Babylonians treat the Israelites? Um, and it's interesting. Remember the Assyrians uh, with... With, with the, when we say Israelites, uh, we ran into the, this last week when we were looking at, uh, I think it was a passage in Jeremiah. Um, with the Assyrians, they were mean and cruel and practiced their, their, practiced their cruelty to the nth degree. Um, the Babylonians, they were mean and cruel, but they took the best that you had to offer and took it back to use, and that included with the people. Remember the story of Daniel. We'll see Daniel, I don't know if he's next week or a couple of weeks away. Um, Daniel goes back, and where does he land? He lands in the court of the king. And so um, the Babylonians treated their conquered, their conquered foes a little bit differently. So we'll see that as we go. Our verse as we get started today, a um, little bit different. Uh, it is a different verse as we go halfway through the, the unit now. It's Isaiah 30, 18. And therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you. Oh, there's an interesting concept when we're talking about God's judgment. Um, and so 
um, he will be gracious to you, and therefore will he be exalted. God's graciousness is exercised toward us, but the whole purpose is that he may be lifted up. Um, let's see if we get, when we get to the New Testament, the book of Acts, um, God does not share his glory with man. God may raise up man, he may promote man, but God's glory is to be directed toward he and he alone. Uh, we see, in the, again, in the book of Acts, um, the king stands up and, he's, and he's, he's given a great speech and the people say, it's the voice of a God and not of a man. And he says, yes, let me pat myself on the back and God killed him. Um, God exercises his graciousness. We receive that, but he needs to be glorified in that. Uh, that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Wait a minute, time out. Grace, mercy, and judgment. Um, Sesame Street comes to mind. One of these things just doesn't belong here. I don't see judgment fitting together with grace and mercy. And yet when we're talking about God, all those qualities have to fit together. How can God be holy and demand holiness of us and yet love us and offer forgiveness? Again, it makes my, my, makes my human frail mind hurt to try to comprehend this. But that's who God is. And he's a God of judgment. Blessed are all they that wait for him. And so God is gracious, he's merciful, and yet he's a God of judgment. So 2 Chronicles, finally we get there. Uh, 2 Chronicles, we're not going to read all 21 verses. I mean, I've used a third of our time already, and we're just into the first, uh, first slide of the actual lesson. But look what we have here, just as we get started. Then the people of the land took Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah, and made him king in his father's stead in Jerusalem. And Jehoahaz, Jehoahaz was 20 and 3 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned three months. <laughs> A very long reign. Three months. Um, three months can seem like forever, and yet three months is nowhere near forever. And the king of Egypt put him down. Wait a minute, time out. Egypt? Remember what we've seen. Nebuchadnezzar is rising in power. He's taking control. He's expanding the kingdom. Egypt won't be an issue for much longer after this. But they're still strong at this point. The king of Egypt put him down at Jerusalem and condemned the land in a hundred talents of silver and a talent of gold. And the king of Egypt made Eliakim his brother king over Judah and Jerusalem and turned his name to Jehoiakim. We've mentioned this before. We've got to make sure we have our minds engaged. We're paying attention because all the names, and here you have a name change. Well, why did the king of Egypt change his name? Because it fit with the message that the king of Egypt wanted to give. Um, and Nico, that's Pharaoh Nico, took Jehoahaz, his brother, and carried him to Egypt. Jehoiakim was 20 and 5 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years. So we've had kings that have reigned years and years. We had a king that reigned for three months. Now we've got his brother reigning for 11 years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. And against him came up Nebuchadnezzar. Look who's on the scene now. And bound him in fetters and carried him to Babylon. So now they have two kings in exile. So who's in charge of Judah? And it tells us in verse 9, but we'll get there in just a second. Look at verse 7. Nebuchadnezzar also carried away the vessels of the house of the Lord to Babylon and put them in his temple at Babylon. So the vessels of the house of God the temple in Jerusalem, were carried away. The temple itself is still standing, but the temple vessels made of precious metals were hauled away. Why were they hauled away? Because they were made of precious metals. And so um, Nebuchadnezzar comes. This is, if you want to say, wave number one. Um, Jehoiakim was eight years old when he began to reign, and reigned three months and ten days. Moving through kings somewhat rapidly now. Um, remember his great-grandfather, Josiah, no, no, grandfather, we had two brothers there, I guess. Um, Josiah was eight when he began, and he reigned for, for a good long time. This guy's eight and does not reign for nearly so long. And notice what's interesting here. Eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned three months, ten days, and did that which was evil. Now stop and think. Are the little munchkins responsible for their behavior and actions? 
interesting question. Here's your answer. Do we need to go any further? Um, and when the year was expired, King Nebuchadnezzar sent and brought him to Babylon. Uh, they now have more kings in exile than they have kings in Jerusalem. And Zedekiah, one and twenty years old, and he began to reign, and he reigned eleven years. Verse 12, and he did that which was evil. Now, there is still a prophet in the land. Maybe, maybe a few prophets in the land. Remember when Elijah, after Mount Carmel, ran and hid and said, I'm the only one, and God said, oh, no, you're not. We know that Jeremiah is around at this time, putting the timeline together. When does Jeremiah end up being taken and removed down out of the way? Uh, it's got a place in there somewhere. But we know that there's a prophet in the land. And yet each of these kings, young or even younger, does that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. We've seen that God has said judgment is coming. God delayed judgment for the good king, Josiah, for the good king, Hezekiah. Ooh. There's no good king here now. Judgment's not being delayed any further. And so we have Jehoiakim, uh, Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, Zedekiah. Um, look at verse 13. And he also rebelled. This makes zero sense. Just humanly speaking. You've got Nebuchadnezzar, the most powerful man on the face of the planet right now, and he's already come down and taken all your toys and taken your brother away and your father away. And now you're going to say, I'm going to do what I want, na 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 na. And guess what he's going to do? I mean, again, humanly speaking, this makes zero sense. What does Zedekiah have to gain from this? Um, pretty simple answer, not much. Now let's just look at some notes from, from this path. Again, time's, time's moving on here. Uh, first of all, uh, Jehoiakim. Again, we've got multiple Jehoiakim, Jehoiakims and all this. Um, there is some question as to exactly how old he was. It says eight here. Another passage says 18. Um, so was he eight or was he eight years into his brother's reign? And there's a little bit of question there. Uh, the only reason we bring it up is because if you have a Bible with cross-references and you happen to look at it, you say, say hmm, this doesn't make sense. Um, it seems as if the 18 is more accurate because in the other passage it talks about the fact that he had wives, um, which would cause us to lean toward the 18 date. Um, we mentioned earlier, God sent prophets. I put again, I could have said again and again and again. But God wasn't going to, God wasn't going to give them mercy because he sent prophets. He would give them mercy if they listened to the prophets. And guess what they didn't do? And so there were prophets. They had opportunity. Um, and yet in the middle of all this, God is still compassionate because what did we just say? God sent prophets. Uh, I mentioned, uh, I don't think it was last week, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, you know, whenever Josie's in trouble, it's like, you're not showing me mercy. Well, there comes a point when, when, when mercy stops. And that's what they're dealing with now. God has shown mercy, and they've not responded properly. They've taken the mercy and basically said, well, thank you very much. We're still going to do what we want. We think of Adam and Eve. Or the entirety of the Garden of Eden, if you want to say the entirety of the face of the planet, was theirs. It's not like their neighbors were just down the street. There weren't any neighbors. The garden is where they were, but even stuff outside the garden that they didn't need to go to, there was nobody else out there. There's one tree they're told, don't, uh, don't, don't take from this tree. One tree. Uh, which means the Garden of Eden had everything they needed to sustain them. Everything. And that tree was not part of the everything. They did not need that tree. And yet God said no, and they said yes. And that's kind of what we see here. God gives them, gives the people of Judah everything that they need. He gives them prophets. He gives, he gives them the preachers and teachers to say, listen to me, follow me. I will give you more time. Follow me. And they say, no. And so God is compassionate, but there comes a point. 
And the next, the, the next note that I have here, uh, the temple is destroyed. At this point, the temple is going to be destroyed. And if we continue on with the, uh, with the passage here, I didn't come to it. But yeah, because look at verse 19. And they burnt the house of God and break down the wall of Jerusalem and burnt all the palaces thereof with fire and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof. And so they come in. Remember, I told you, it comes in three waves. And then the last wave, Nebuchadnezzar says, enough of this. And all the, all the landmark places, the important places, the temple and the palaces, he burns them. And not only do they burn them, uh, remember, a lot of their building is wood. A lot of their building is stone. Stone does not burn real well. So what do they do? They burn it, and then, well, there's one more piece here. Remember, the, the walls of the house of God were lined with precious metals, particularly gold. When they burnt the gold, where'd the gold go? So the soldiers did what? They took the walls and broke them apart to get between the stones to get the gold out. So the annihilation of the temple was, was thorough. When they destroyed it, they really destroyed it. Turn to the book of Jeremiah, and I think we stay in Jeremiah the, for the rest of our time today, I think. Looks like it. Jeremiah, we mentioned that they had a prophet still, and they had a prophet that was fairly well known. They, they, they knew where he was. They could listen to him. Jeremiah 25. Now, I've mentioned numerous times. My Bible has headers tucked in between all the, the verses and stuff like that. And the header at the beginning of chapter 25 says, Judah ignores warnings, plural, of prophets, plural. Look at the, look at the uh, verse 1 of chapter 25 of Jeremiah. The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Jeho uh, Josiah, the king of Judah, that was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. All right. We're going to have a quick quiz. Put your timeline together. You're going to get lots of dates. Not dates as in, this was 724 and this was 16, you know. No, we're going to get like the fifth year of this guy and the first year of that guy and the third year of this guy. It, it, it can be tough to follow. Um, the which Jeremiah the prophet spake unto all the people of Judah and to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, from the 13th year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, the king of Judah, even unto this day, that is three and twentieth year, the word of the Lord hath come unto me, and I have spoken unto you, rising early and speaking, but ye have not hearkened. What's Jeremiah saying? Hey, you've had every opportunity for twenty years to hear the word of God, and you have ignored it. That's kind of harsh and unloving, isn't it? Kind of true also, but hey. Look at verse 4. The Lord hath sent unto you all his servants, the prophets. Notice the plural. Jeremiah says, I'm not the only one. You've had people telling you what you need to hear. They rose up early. You have not hearkened, nor inclined your ear to hear. They said, turn again, everyone from his evil way, from the evil of your doings. Go not after other gods. Don't worship them. Don't serve them. Don't provoke me to anger. Look at verse 7. But ye have not hearkened unto me. I mean, Jeremiah basically says, you have had every opportunity and more. This is on you. They can't blame God. God, where's your mercy? Oh, God, be gracious to us. And God says, I've been merciful and gracious, and you've ignored me. Well, from what this passage here, we see Jeremiah's been a prophet for 23 years. Uh, he's, <laughs> he's been a prophet for how many kings? Keeping in mind some of the, these kings were on the throne for only a couple months. He's been there. He has seen this. Uh, this particular message, year four of Jehoiakim, year one of Nebuchadnezzar. And the people continued to reject. Uh, they've seen Nebuchadnezzar destroy Assyria. They know. Let's see. Jeremiah prophesied that judgment will come from the north. Their first thought was Assyria. It's not Assyria. They have a pretty good idea now. God didn't name him at that point, but they can probably figure out the name. And it tells us within the, within the passages here, God chose to use Nebuchadnezzar. Now that's interesting. Judgment upon Judah did not come from just some obscure guy out in the desert. God said, this man is going to come and punish my people. And it's interesting to see, uh, this was... 
Is this what God wanted? No. Is this what God directed? Yes. Turn over to chapter 29. Chapter 29, as we continue here. Again, we'll do the same thing. Just look at a few of the verses here. Um, we didn't really see it. Again, I'm trying to make sure that we don't get halfway through and then run out of time here. But back in the Second Chronicles passage, it talked about the fact that uh, Nebuchadnezzar took away from the people and carried them back to Babylon. Okay, so he took the people into exile. And that's what we see here in chapter 29. Uh, Jeremiah, uh, now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem unto the residue of the elders which were carried away captives into the priests and the prophets and to all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. So Jeremiah, a prophet in Jerusalem, is writing to the people at Babylon so that they can hear the word of God. Um, I won't. I want to make smart aleck comments about they didn't use the U.S. Postal Service or it wouldn't have gotten there yet, but we won't worry about that. Um, after that, Jeconiah the king and the queen and the eunuchs and the princes of Judah and Jerusalem and the carpenters and the smiths were departed from Jerusalem. Look what happens. Nebuchadnezzar takes the important people and the skilled craftsmen. Remember what we said just a little bit ago. He takes those people who can benefit his kingdom. He takes the important people that might lead an insurrection or rebellion, to whom there is some nationalistic pride, and he takes those skilled people, those skilled craftsmen, who can benefit his kingdom. And he sends this, this letter, uh, look at verse 4, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captive, whom I have caused, whom I have caused, notice that, they went, not because Nebuchadnezzar was big and strong, but because God said so, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. And notice what he tells them, build ye houses, Translated, you're not coming back tomorrow. Build ye houses and dwell on them and plant gardens and eat the fruit of them. Take ye wives and beget sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and daughters for your husbands that they may bear sons and daughters that ye may be increased there and not diminished. Interesting. God says, you might as well settle down and make it home. And... The message of the 70-year captivity will come to them. Uh, so he writes them a letter, the people that are in captivity. He is concerned for the people of God, whether the people of God are in Jerusalem, in the outlying areas, or even in Babylon. Um, and it mentions in here, uh, verse 2, uh, after that, Jeconiah the king. Um, Jeconiah is Jehoiakim that we saw back in uh, Second Chronicles. Uh, in another passage, he's mentioned, uh, named as Coniah. Remember we said we have to engage brain because sometimes people's names are very similar and sometimes their names are the same and sometimes the same person has multiple names. And we can see that um, sometimes you're called by your nickname, and sometimes you're called by the shortened version of your name, and sometimes you're called by your complete full name, and that's kind of what we have here. Uh, we so see this in the passage. God was the cause of the captivity. God, and, and the wording of the, I chose the wording because that's the way it says here, I caused you to go, but God wasn't the cause. Their sin was the cause. But because of their sin, God, God caused them to go into captivity. And his intention was for repopulation. But in order for that repopulation to take place, there needs to be a population in Babylon. You can't send people back from Babylon to Jerusalem if there's no people left in Babylon. So what does Jeremiah tell them in his letter? Go ahead and make yourselves a home. Build houses, plant gardens, have kids. And when your kids are grown up, which is going to happen, they're there for 70, 70 years, when your kids are grown up, have them married off so that they can have kids. It basically, he says, you go live your life there. And yet, remember, we talked about three waves. There's going to be additional deportation because, uh, from this point here because the people still didn't repent. And so God's, God's not done with Jerusalem yet. Uh, again, we flipped over here to Jeremiah now, so in the timeline we kind of moved some things around, but as, as Jeremiah writes to them, 
that third wave, the destruction of the temple and the burning of the city, hasn't taken place yet. There's going to be additional people sent into exile. And that moves us to the map. Now, I don't expect you to be able to read everything on the map, but um, on the map, you've got um, Israel is in the north. Uh, keeping in mind, the two, the two kingdoms together, Israel and Judah, are still incredibly small. Uh, you may have a map in the back of your Bible that you can look at and get a better picture of what's happening here. But um, Israel was to the north, Judah to the south. Israel was carried into captivity, and they're up here in the As Assyria. Um, Judah in the south is taken into captivity and lands over here. Uh, we mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. Was it Basra, I think, was the city that we, that we put in that general neighborhood where Babylon would be located? Um, if we look at our map of modern times, we have not Babylon, we have Iraq. And as you move up the river from the, uh, from the, the Gulf, you get to, uh, the, the, again, if, they weren't, if the city weren't on the river, they didn't have much to drink. So pretty much you can follow the river and see all the major cities. And so um, they get up to uh, Babylon, and that's the capital, Babylon being placed right here under, it says Babylonia, this is the kingdom, and here is the, the city of Babylon upriver. But they tended to not travel straight across as the bird would fly. Because if there's no water, there's not much to drink. So they would travel up to the mountain area and then back, back down the river. And so the people are, are, are exiled. They're, they're carried away. And it's not like they're going to go home for the weekend. Well, application question. Um, what have we learned about uh, or have confirmed about Scripture as we, read, as we study the passage today? Uh, as I was coming up with the thoughts, and, uh, one is that even in the midst of judgment, God still loved his people. Even as judgment is taking place, and it takes place over a period of time, God still has the prophets there preaching to them and telling them to repent. And God tells them, through the prophets, hey, my plan is to have the area repopulated, and that can only happen if I bless you, and that can only happen if you obey. And this is quite simply more. There's, there's more there. I knew at this point, time is of the essence, and time is getting away. Uh, but as you stop and think from where you're seated right now, what are things that you could say, well, you know, I see this, this, and this. There, there's a lot to see here. Uh, we move quickly through the lesson. Uh, if you find yourself thinking, I can't believe the people of Judah saw what happened to Israel and didn't turn to God, what are you forgetting about yourself? <laughs> what am I forgetting about myself? And we mentioned this when we, when we saw, Judah carry, uh, saw Israel carried away. Remember we had uh, Hosea, the prophet, talks about the fact of Judah and Israel as sisters. And you saw the older sister, and you followed right in her footsteps. And we said, how could they, how could they do this? The answer is pretty simple. There are people just like us. And what would we do? Probably the same thing they did. Um, because all men have a sin nature. Uh, that's unfortunate. Life would be so much better if we didn't. But it's the fact. Uh, the Bible tells us fairly clearly. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We also see from this, something that we need to understand, is that the battle is daily. We can't fight sin today and say, ooh, I'm, I, I was successful, good. I, I'm good for the rest of my life. No, because what happens tomorrow? <laughs> uh, the fight continues. Uh, we had Josiah, we'll pause for a moment here. Oh, we have Josiah, good king, better king than they'd ever had. And his son, not so much. We mentioned uh, a few weeks ago Hezekiah. We had the lesson with Hezekiah and Isaiah and all that. And Hezekiah was a good king. Well, probably if we were ranking them, say, say, number two in the goodness scale. Um, and yet Hezekiah's son, for the kings of Judah, was like number one in the badness scale. Just because you have a good king doesn't mean that the good king's always going to be good, Joash. And just because you have a good king doesn't mean the next king is going to be good. The, the, battle, the battle against sin is daily. Now, what do the actions of the Babylonians tell us about the nature of mankind? Uh, first of all, there is definitely a, a lust for power and wealth. Do we see that in the world around us? Uh, it doesn't mean that, you know, how often do we misquote the verse that Paul wrote to Timothy talking about money 
and the lust for money, and the money is the root of all evil. He doesn't say money. is. He says the love of money is the root of all evil. Or the lust for money is the root of all evil. Uh, we see that the human heart is corrupt. The human heart does not, by its very nature, want to follow after God. It wants its personal satisfaction. We also see here that the Babylonians had no respect for God. It's not as if they came and took the vessels from the house of God so that they could worship Jehovah God back in Babylon. They simply added them to the, as trophies to the temple of their false gods. They had no respect for God. And we see that in Daniel. We'll see that again. I don't know if it's next week or the coming week. And we'll see that with Daniel when Nebuchadnezzar stands out and says, this is my great kingdom that I have developed. And God says, ha ha, guess what? Hope the grass tastes good. Um, because God does not share his glory with mankind. And the Babylonians had no respect for God. Uh, well, future events. Um, now, future events from the time period that we're looking at. Um, does our study set up today? God says, I am going to have a remnant of people that I am going to send back. I'm going to repopulate Judah, Jerusalem. There's going to be a return. And the temple will be rebuilt. Now, and, and again, I, I say we know this, we're familiar with this, I would assume. But each time they rebuild the temple, it gets a little bit less grand. The Temple of Solomon, magnificent. The temple rebuilt after the Babylonian captivity, it's good. The temple of Herod, it'll do. Each time they rebuild it, it gets a little bit less grand. But they're still going to be able to return and rebuild the temple, which is some of what God is setting in, setting in motion even now when they're still in the midst of being carried away to captivity. As we wrap up, take your Bibles. We're going to look at one verse. I might look at another one, but we'll look at one verse particularly here. Go to Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah 29 here. And verse 11. The next, the next slide from, this is from our friends at Answers in Genesis, and, it, and it's, it's good. It, again, it, it doesn't really fit in, but because it's in the passages that we're looking at, they say, uh, Jeremiah 29 and 11 is often pulled out of its context and used as a life verse. Uh, and they want to point out, um, when we look at it in context, for thus saith the Lord, after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you, in causing you to return to this land. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. The passage, the verse is a great verse, but it's specifically directed toward a particular people in a, in a particular time. Does God know what he thinks for us? And does God want good for us? Well, yes, he does. Is this the best verse to, for us to use for that? Well, no, we could probably go to Romans 8 where it tells us that God works all things together for good to them that love God. Hey, I'm one that loves God. Okay, I, I can meet the criteria for Romans 8. I really don't know that I can meet the criteria for Jeremiah 29, 11. And the only reason that, again, the only reason they mention that is because that's such a familiar verse to most people, and it's tucked within the pattern. Now, again, because we're flying through, we didn't read it the first time through, but it's tucked in here, and there's so many people that, hey, this is a great verse. It is a great verse especially when we see it in context and what its intended purpose was. Even in the midst of judgment, God says, you know what? The judgment is not the end of the story. The judgment is but one step in the story. God says, I'm going to bring you back because my thoughts are of peace, not of evil. Now, in the midst of Nebuchadnezzar knocking down the gates and the walls of Jerusalem, did the people see that, that God's plan was for peace? No. But judgment was necessary. But God's purpose didn't end there. And so uh, we simply point out that, you know what, we can see the same message, probably a little bit better verse for us to use for that. And that wraps everything up, and according to the clock on the wall, we're pretty much right on time. Um, but God brings judgment. If we wanted to go back to that title slide, God judges Judah. Uh, why? Because they refused to listen. Now let's 
take a, an additional application thought here that's not in our slides. We come to church every week. We sit in, the, sit in the seat every week. We hear the preaching every week. And we walk out every week. Hopefully we walk out changed every week. Because our whole purpose for coming is to what? Listen with the intent to apply. If I'm simply listening because that's what's being said at the moment and I'm going to ignore it as I walk out the door, then what's the point? The people of, of Israel, the people of Judah did that. We listen so that we can put it to practice. We listen so that we can have our hearts and lives changed. The human heart is, well, this, this same Jeremiah guy, uh, something about the, the, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. That hasn't changed. Whether you're Jeremiah writing in the 700s B.C. or whether you're me, or 500s B.C., let's get the time frame right, whether you're Jeremiah writing in the 500s B.C. or you're me standing here in 2021, the condition of man's heart hasn't changed. The heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Well, there is one good answer to that. God knows. And the same God who sent judgment offers grace and mercy. And wants to, what was that? He wants to do that which is good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Who gets to define what's good? God does. And his good is a whole lot better than what I could ever dream of. And so as we come and, and sit and listen in church, let's have hearts and minds that are open and attentive to what he has for us, that we can put it to practice, that he can do a work in us and through us. Father, thank you so